And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, creator of the Weird West meets high fantasy shenanigans known as Pistol Dust, and a, and a man who, and a, and a man of multiple colors in his eyes, because I had to make a heterochromia joke at least somehow. Try saying that five times fast. The one and only Fox Cern. How you doing tonight, man? I'm doing all right. So, I like to I like to start at the humble beginnings in these kind of things. Well, aside from the drinking, of course, but. Walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Uh, geez, going all the way back. Uh, so I started playing D and D Second Edition when I was eight. because uh, I had um someone who was very important in my life who pretty much had been playing D&D since it started. And he got me into it when I was very young. And I have never stopped playing. I would have loved to be a fly on the wall when it came to exp explaining Thaco to an eight-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> right? Uh, and the system they, uh, they used was absolutely brutal. It was gritty realism through and through. Like, you think, for those of you who know what second edition is, you think that's tough? Try staying at your level one hit points for you the entire game. You never gain hit points. All right. Even, wor even worse if you end up having to go through Tomb of Horrors, a.k.a. Bullshit, the module. Yeah. A module that I've heard that I've heard was designed solely because um, some of Gygax's players were complaining that the modules were getting too easy. Yep. I don't have any proof so. whether or not that was the case, but I could believe it because because again, bullshit. Yeah, it was just a flat out meat grinder. Um, I hope to God you didn't end up being stuck with Ranger during those during those days. I uh, no my my character was a rogue. Okay, That's so where I started it off. Yeah, so skill monkeys. Yeah. It was fun. Mm -hmm. Now, did you mostly stick with D&D &D over the years, or did you experiment with other systems? I've mostly played D&D &D up until the system that... Sh <laughs> the version that shall not be named, and then I switched to Pathfinder. <laughs> until 5th edition came out. Oh yeah, the the system everyone tells me I'm supposed to hate, but they but the paychecks don't clear, so I don't. And yeah. this, and the and the bandage system, or or as I've sometimes called it, the eternal one step forward, two steps back. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot I like in Pathfinder, but Paizo has this habit of introducing really cool ideas and then not going all the way with them. Yeah, and. The fact that they made it open source, where it's like, oh yeah, if a book comes out, it's official content. So you end up with, like, hundreds of books that are all technically legal. It's like, you, how do you, you manage blame, this? You can blame the open game license back in 2000 for that kind of thing. They just expanded upon it. Right. Don't get me wrong. I loved Pathfinder. I love 3.5. Fourth was just not my cup of tea. I've I've liked fourth. I've liked fourth. I do think fourth gets a gets a fair bit of over hate, um, and I also th I also think it's a I also think it's hilarious how so, how some people who claim to be lifers clearly don't know their history <laughs> when it comes when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to um, D and D throughout the editions, um, mm. especially given how. Third edition got a lot of shit in its early days, including the accusation that it was turning D and D into Diablo. Yeah, I I, I can kind of understand that argument, but 
Well, the the irony is that there was is that there was a D, is that there have there's been a few Diablo modules for AD and D. Right. There was a lot of crossover for that kind of stuff. They were not exclusive. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Oh yeah. But when but when it comes to when it, com- when it comes to focusing on focusing on that and then venturing into this um weird this weird west fantasy approach that you have with pistol dust i would like to play a bit of lightning round slash word association when it comes to weird west or even wild west um properties and see and see if you've dipped into them in some form all right so i'll start i'll start with the big one that a lot of people think of when they think of weird west role playing deadlands Oh yes, gosh! Deadlands was a big exper- uh, um, a big inspiration early on. Uh, all right. In Pistol Dust, um, I are you are I, we talking I, classic I, Deadlands or um, Savage Worlds Deadlands? Uh, one second. Let me look at what copy I have of Deadlands. Uh, it is classic. All right. I mean. Deadlands was was kind of the was kind of the um pr- was kind of the prototype for what would become Savage Worlds in a lot of ways, but it's one mm-hmm. of those it's one of those things I think is worth worth making clear. Um, right. So let me go with an old classic, Boot Hill. Boot Hill that I am not familiar with. Boot Hill was fr- was from t- was from uh, TSR. It's it's one of the I would say it's a hidden gem of TSR, but let's be honest. For a lot of people, anything that isn't D and D that TSR did is a hidden gem. Some yeah. of them, although some of them should be staying hidden, like say their Indiana Jones RPG. Right. Um. Now, when it uh. now, I know that you mentioned the good, the the good, the bad, and the ugly. And yes, I love western movies. Yeah. So, I'd like to expand that into in, into into westerns and western and western equivalents and see if you've dipped into them. One of the obvious I got to get out of my system is The Good, the Bad and the Weird. Oh, yes. I love that movie. That was a fun trip. Um, speaking of trip, Sukiyaki Western Django. No, I've not seen that one. It's stiff. Um, it's a Takashi Miike piece, which me- which means it's out of its damn mind. And for some reason, he had a bunch of Japanese actors trying to speak English while do while doing a west a western inspired by the War of the Roses and the Tale of Genji. Oh. Su- it sounds up my alley. Unsurprisingly, Takashi Miike is best is best friends with Tarantino. <laughs> um, <laughs> Since you mentioned, since we brought up the Dollars trilogy, I may as well bring up another famous or infamous um, trilogy when it comes to westerns, and that be- that being the El Mariachi trilogy. Mariachi, that I have not seen in a long, long time. Mm-hmm. Oh, I do. And when it comes to when it comes to vid- when it comes to video game ends, some people would bring up. Um, Say gun or re- or Red Dead Re- Red Dead Redemption in this regard. I'm gonna go one. I'm gonna go one step off the beaten path and ask if you if you're familiar at all with the Wild Arms series of RPGs. Yes, actually, I am. <laughs> which would make which oh. would make you the fir- the first in a while here in the temple who who is familiar with that. Although Wild Arms Four does not exist. Man, Wild Arms, you went way out into left field there. <laughs> Yeah. I will admit I've only played one, and I don't remember which one it was. But um, I am familiar with Wild Arms. Do you remember what system it was on? I can probably narrow it down there. Uh, PlayStation. It was probably t- was it was probably two? Wild Arms Two. If it was, okay. If it was PS One, it was probably either one or two. If it was PS Two, it was probably it was probably three, four, or Alter Code F. And I seriously doubt you had a PSP at any point, so XF wouldn't have been something you had tried. Oh, that's where you're wrong. I do have a PSP. 
Okay. It's sitting on my shelf. It does not work, but I do have it. <laughs> okay. okay, I but, stand corrected. But no, I did not. I'm pretty sure I played it on my PlayStation. Mm -hmm. Rented it from Blockbuster. No, then it would have been the... No, it was on my PlayStation 2. In that case, it was probably 3. Yeah. Three, three to... three or, it could have been either 3 or 5. Um, 4... If it was four, if it was four, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have had as high of a, high of a statement. But do you remember if it had um, hexes in combat? Hexes. I Hexagon. cannot remember. That was so long ago. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't thought of this series in a long time. Yeah. <laughs> since, since that, since Wild Arms is is a mix of fa of fantasy and the Wild West, that's that's something I be remiss if I didn't bring up another one okay. that isn't necessarily western but is cl but is close enough when it comes to the level of technology that I'd want to bring up if you're familiar with is Iron Kingdoms slash War Machine uh I am very familiar with uh Iron Kingdoms I used to work for Privateer Press okay well that I didn't know uh yes <laughs> so more, more you know <laughs> on that more you know on that front um now with that with that kind of thing in mind tell me talk to me about the or the origin of the idea of doing um pistol dust and was it something that started out as say a say a d and d campaign setting that you were running that just exploded into a life of its own or did it, it have a different origin path it was it was kind of a different origin path it wasn't a sort of a thing that i like, this was a campaign setting that I came up with. That wasn't it. It was... I, I wanted to make a game that I wanted to play. Because there are so many systems out there that I'm just like, oh, I like this, but I don't like this about it. And it, it got frustrating. And somebody just told me, well, then why don't you make your own game? And it's like, fine, I will go make my own game. And with blackjack and hookers, with blackjack and hookers, and <laughs> which, given the subject matter, that's even that's even more apropos here. It is. But since you <laughs> since you mentioned that there were cases of of games where you liked you liked X, but you didn't like Y in that particular system, um, could you give me a few examples of that and what you wanted to? do in response to that issue? Um, well, I guess the big one is 5th edition. Because, mm -hmm. honestly, that's probably what I've been playing the most. Like, And what I was playing at the beginning when I started. Like, there was... I, f I felt like you were too railroaded in 5th. It's, it's changed a lot now. Considering how, how many subclasses there are now, they're honestly... I feel like there are too many and not enough at the same time. If I'm being, if I'm being honest, the, subcla the subclass thing is, start, is starting to feel like the prestige class explosion from 20 years ago. And yes. It's, it's, nice that there, it's nice that there is, that subclasses are there, but I think, I think, that, I think the... Um, I think that, that that subclass is being one of your key um so one of your key sources of varying up from your class is a bandage <laughs> if I'm being yes honest. like but if you have two ch if you have two champion f if you have two um champion fighters how much how di how different can you make them between each other without bringing in feats right they're though, pretty much they're pretty much the exact same and even with feats, like, is a case of missing the point. Yes. I mean, did three point five and Pathfinder have way too many feats? Yes. Does yes. turning feats into an alternative for ASI fix um, address that issue? No. No. No, it does not. Oh. The purpose and of it I've always interpreted me. feats as an evolution of the proficiency thing that was being tooled around with in AD and D, but never but didn't have enough time to cook. Yeah. And it was the idea was to allow personalization. Now granted, 
the way they went about it certainly had issues because not only were there way too many, they weren't properly organized, and as my as my mentor would say, the feats had more traps than a whorehouse in Thailand. Yeah, a lot of them, and it a lot of them felt useless. And fifth has that too, where. 70% of the feats or so, it's just like, they're useless. This would never come up in a game. Well, there's also the fact that you're only getting four feats total if you even get that far, because so many adventures taper off once you get into the teens. Unless you're a fighter, but yeah. Oh yeah, the feater. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> And I'm, gu I'm guessing since you, since we're since we're um, burying D D and D for the umpteenth time, um, I'm guessing that you probably also had an issue with some of the um, power disparities, like say Godzilla in 3.5 or Cowzilla in fifth. Yeah. <laughs> and like, it just it didn't. I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the fact that you're like, oh yeah, cool, you get a subclass, but. You can build the same exact character and take the subclass, and even if you take a different subclass, you're not that different. One particular infamous moment that I, I will always remember when it came to subclasses was when they tried to introduce psionics as a series of subclasses. Oh, yeah. And the, and the psionic was a subclass of wizard who cast spells with his mind despite that not being a precedent at all. <laughs> yeah. There, there were a lot of class there were a lot of classes and prestige classes that should have been their own thing that were forced into that subclass system. Yeah, because they were they were afraid to add more classes. That's honestly that's as far as I'm concerned, that's the short and the long of it is they were afraid to add more classes. They are, so, they are so hesitant and reluctant to add a new class. Oh, how long? How long did it's only it's only in the last year or so that they've even tooled with the idea of prestige classes, and yeah, class, class mods have been a thing that have been that's been experimented on by the third party, not by the first party. Yes, but give now. Given th given th given that, um, as I as as I'm as I understand it, um, Pistol Dust is using a two D twelve system. Yes. And what was the reason you went with two D twelve? Was it a bell curve reason, or was there some a different reason? To be completely honest, it was because D twelves don't get enough love. Preach. <laughs> But D12s are the, as far as I, I'm concerned, the most underused, underutilized dice. And everybody has them. But it's just like, when was the last time you picked up your D12 when you weren't playing a Barbarian? Um, I, can say, I can say that the only time that I've used D12s extensively have been for non-D20 based games. Right. Um, stuff, stuff like, say, um, the say blade of blade of the iron throne or or encore where that mm -hmm. d12 is the core dice you're going to be using for their system and you're going to be rolling them in pools so best get more of those d12s right i just i don't know i like d12s mm -hmm. i very much do like d12s and they just don't see enough use and I've built a system around two D twelve. Now I'm get I'm guessing that it I'm guessing that the way it ends up working is roll is roll high versus the target difficulty. Yes. And you get modifiers with skills and abilities and talents. Um and... now of course five E had the advantage disadvantage thing, which um isn't which was basically there out to try and do less plus two minus two modif situational modifiers. Once yes. again, swinging the pendulum too far the other way. But in your system, do you have a similar approach where you'd roll an extra and then drop one? Uh, currently, there are talents that do special things like that. 
there is a specific uh, talent tree called the Gambler, and it is all about doing fancy things with dice, like rolling extra dice or rolling twice or rolling this and keeping numbers from that you've rolled. Yeah. Now, would it be fair of me to... S is it a case where in order to get in order to get a crit or a bot, you'd have to roll either snake eyes or double twelves? No. Pistol Dust uses luck. Mm -hmm. So when you're making your character, you take your 2d12 and you roll them and you round up or down to for balance reasons to eight or down to sixteen. Mm -hmm. But then that is your character your character's luck score. And any time you roll a 13, you then roll again to try and beat your luck score. Beating your luck score gets you a crit. Failing your luck score, crit fail. And was the reason to do this to um to make to make it so that a die ro a die roll isn't exactly um safe? Yes. That's a big part of it. Um, another part is 13 is the most common number rolled on 2d12. Mm -hmm. Where, and like, a 2 or a 24, they're so you're like talking about decimal point percentage chances to get those numbers. Mm -hmm. So instead of making crit successes and crit failures rare, like a 1 and a 20, where you have an equal chance of rolling either one. Instead, I've built the system to focus yourself on perhaps constantly or never rolling them by making it the most common number that you would roll. Mm -hmm. Now, Take, now, with that in mind, I'd like to go. I'd like to go into a bit of what you call modular class design. And yes, since we picked on Five E's class setup of, be, of being very railroady and not and not allowing personalization. Um, yes, is it a case where the where um where since you mentioned talent trees that that classes or archetypes as you call it are more are, are a selection of talent trees? Yes. So there are six archetypes, and they're more, they're general things. These are like where you get your trained skills from, and like what uh, talent trees will be the cheapest for you. Because uh, the way that Pistol Dust does it is it rewards you for staying in your archetype by giving you a discount when you are purchasing talents. However, it doesn't punish you for buying talents that aren't in your archetype. Like, if you want to play a gunslinger, and then you're like, but I want to do magic stuff, I'm going to just start buying magic talents. You can totally do that. Now, <clears throat> since you brought up magic, that's one other thing I'd, li I'd like to touch on. Um, now, give, given, given a lot of the time you spent with D and D over the years. What's your t what has been your take over the years of the um, spell charges and sp and basically the Vancian model that D and D has used since day one? I hate spell slots. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hate spell slots. Did we just if you could friends? if you could get more spell slots, I'd be fine with them. But the fact that you're locked in, especially in fourth, come on. Four level one, four level one spell slots. Are you serious? Four? That's it? Don't even get me started on warlock. I don't even want to touch that. But I hate spell slots so much. Like I so said, did I... we just become friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I have, Screw I have spell never, slots. I have never been. I think, I think the concept of spell slots. Has has its pl has its place if it's done properly. Yes. Um, I feel like because D and D misses the mark, not by much, but they miss the mark. 
Well, the sole reason it's there, despite what some traditionalists will say, is because of the fact that it is a it is a carryover from chainmail. Which was yeah. which was it which was more in the war game thing because war games were pretty big in the seventies. Right. And the idea for that was the wizard was going to be the equivalent of the artillery. And if you look at a lot of war games that have mages, that's pretty that's pretty much still the case. Yeah. Even to the point where some of them have have to deal with um have to deal with scatter the way the way say a cannonball would have to deal with scatter. Which doesn't doesn't make too much sense, but it's still neat. Mm -hmm. However, however, there is also the fact that one of the key inspirations for that is the Dying Earth books by Jack Vance, hence the term Vancean. Um, mm -hmm. The problem that which work which worked in the which worked in the sense that Jack Van that Jack Vance's Dying Earth was of much more sword and sorcery style of environment but D, &D e as it has evolved over the years has le has leaned further was never really uh, was never really in that same sword and sorcery vibe even in the early days debatably it had far more in common with high fantasy given how mad given how prevalent magic is in some form or another <laughs> Whether whether right. it be whether it be the the phenomenal cosmic power that wizards couldn't attain, or the fact that so many established modules were, could be summed up as a wizard did some fuckery. Right. <laughs> but the but it is but when you have that, it's very hard to justify the necessity of preparing your spells in that in the way that it does and. And the fact that you have to, that you're not going to get those spells back until you do a full rest, which is where you have the Nova issue. Yeah, Pistol Dust takes all of that and throws it away. So, with that in mind, how, how would I be correct in assuming that magic use is just another talent tree? Uh, it it is and it isn't. There are there are talent trees that allow it, but it's actually a skill. Okay. So, to start with magic, you have to talk about, in Pistol Dust, Backlash and Lucidity. Lucidity is your own sort of mental fortitude and your, and your spellcasting ability. Mm -hmm. Outside of, like, the actual magical skills. Anytime you cast a spell, and you can cast any spell that you know, anytime that you want. But when you do, you have to make a backlash check. And depending on how high level the spell is, the backlash check is more difficult. If you succeed the backlash check, you cast the spell as normal. Mm -hmm. If you fail the backlash check, you will take damage to your lucidity. Mm -hmm. And if you hit zero lucidity, you pass out. In that regard, would it be not too dissimilar from Spell Drain in Shadowrun? Yes, it's very much similar. Now, given given that, um, in order to, in order to actually get spells, what would that would the acquisition of spells be be considered a be considered a talent, or are you going with the route of people have to find spells the old fashioned way? You can do. Essentially all three. There are talents that give you spells, you can find spells and learn them, or you can spend your experience and purchase spells mm -hmm. with that. So it's sort of like your own character coming up with how to cast spell. Which, so that brings me to another thing that some people have criticized about the Vancean model, which I can understand where they're coming from, but it's... But it's not a case where I love it or hate it. It's more about how it's used, and that is the fire and forget issue. I.e., no matter how no matter who casts it or or how or how strong they are, a f say throwing a fireball is going to do the exact same effect. Hence the whole well... fire and forget. Are you are you going with that route with spe with spells or are there means to customize an individual spell that's cast? There are ways to customize the spell. Mm -hmm. 
there are similar like sorcerers that have meta magics where they can change the spells and then there's also increasing the backlash of a spell to have it do more damage have a larger aoe mm -hmm. things like that which i i can i can certainly get that it's it's one of the given how personalization is is such a big deal in this setup I want. I wanted to make sure that that's something that carries through with with um spell casting. Oh yes, of course. Like if we take fireball for instance, which is the the big staple. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to cast a really big fireball, and just up the damage to immense levels, because a fireball in pistol dust. Sure, it has a large AoE, but it only does one damage. Mm -hmm. However, every point that you up the backlash ups the damage. So you can increase that fireball to do six damage if you're confident you can succeed by upping the backlash by five. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked... We talked we talked about archetypes a bit ago, and yes, I'd like to I'd like to get a kind of a vibe for the play, for the play style, the sandbox of each of the archetypes that you have. And I'd like to start from top to bottom on that. All so, right, uh, first one would be charlatan. Charlatan, that's your uh, your burglar, your gambler, and your dancer. Mm -hmm. Those are your talent traits that are in the charlatan. Burglar is your classic rogue, thief, sneaky guy. Mm -hmm. um, gambler is you are just screwing around with dice a lot and <laughs> cheating a lot of cards. Mm -hmm. And I really like the gambler because it lets you do... <laughs> Some of the trees in Pistol Dust kind of go, I am playing a different game mm -hmm. than everyone else. I am trying to do other things. Because with Gambler, you're like, uh, you're saving numbers to try and build pairs or a flush, essentially. Mm -hmm. With sequential numbers in order to do neat things. Mm -hmm. And then there's, um, there's Dancer, which is uh, kind of a nod to the promiscuous ladies of the night. Mm. Um, but they're uh, a magic class, kind of similar to a, a sorcerer where they have innate magical casting abilities. Mm -hmm. no. And oh, good. Uh, I was just going to say, and they have two inner trees where they have the Dance of the Phoenix and the Dance of the Lamia, where it depends on if you're going for flashy damage or more sultry persuasiveness. Mm -hmm. um, next would be Magi. So one of the, so one of I'd I'd say this would be the classic a lot of the classical mage approaches. Yes, uh, the trees in Magi are Guncaster, Sorcerer, and Wizard. Mm -hmm. Guncaster is, you take bullets and you carve magic in. Essentially, you precast your spells before combat. Mm -hmm. And you have, so you have certain spells prepared before going into combat. Uh, sorcerer is your kind of, again, classic innate magical bloodlines and things like that. They also have magical tattoos that they can apply to themselves and some to other people mm. in order to do special bonuses and all of that towards them. Kind of, kind of like adepts. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, kind of. I believe. I believe one of the last one was wizard. I'm guessing wizard. That's, the, that's the classical approach. 
That's the classical, I've got a book full of spells. Mm -hmm. And they also can be um, spell swords. That's where, so if you want to be the magic swordsman, you go through the wizard. And they also have your enchanting weapons and making magical items. Mm -hmm. Now, ra now with Ranger, uh, first uh, first off, I'm pretty sure the Ranger in this one isn't going to be as cursed as the Five E Ranger. No, this is this is more based on like the Western Rangers. This is your bounty hunter, gunslinger, and your hounds. The bounty hunter is all about like uh long range rifles and um either downing people without killing them or making sure that they are dead. Mm -hmm. And then you have your gunslinger, your classic western all about being super fast, throwing out lots of shots mm -hmm. and trick shooting. Which is your disarming with the gun, the the um, fanning the hammer, mm -hmm. the shooting the 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 hangman's rope, mm -hmm. which is not an easy thing. <laughs> no, and and then uh, the houndsman is the sort of animal companion type thing where it's like you train the dog to do tricks and kill people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, that, br that brings me to the scholar. Yes. So, the scholar is an interesting archetype. You have alchemist, mm -hmm. artificer, Doctor and musician. In your, the alchemist is all about putting magic into potions. Mm -hmm. You can create the magical effects that a spell would do in a bottle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they also have the um, pathfinder. Bottle bombs, where you throw explosive, volatile chemicals at people, mm -hmm. and lots and lots of customization for that. And then mutagens, where you can turn yourself into Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, when it comes to the spiritualist... Oh. Mm-hmm. Would that be would that be more akin to a non martial cleric? The, yes, the the cleric equivalent is preacher, mm -hmm. and you also have your paladin, which is a crusader, mm -hmm. and then there's also oracle, which is kind of druid, but not really. It's more of a a mixture. No, I wouldn't even call it a mixture. It's kind of a crazy thing that allows you to gain bonuses by seeing what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. Or changing fate and preventing things from happening so that somebody gets a bonus. Telling somebody, don't shoot there, shoot this person, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. And I'm guessing Warrior is your heavy weapons guy. Yes, this is uh, the knight, the pugilist, soldier, and then it's also got the toughness and defense trees. Mm -hmm. And now moving moving past the, moving past that, when it comes to when it comes to the setup that you have, um, is First, first off, when it first off, when it comes to get when it comes to this sort this sort of roles that you're going to be doing, is this game going to be heavily dependent on sk on skills? And if so, have you meant are you taking steps to make sure you don't have a skill overload? 
Yes, um, it is quite dependent on skills. You don't need to be trained in a skill to succeed at something. It helps to get some bonuses to it. Mm-hmm. Um, there are quite a number of skills. It's not as much as Pathfinder, though, but it is more than 5th edition. So I feel like Pathfinder has too many skills, but at the same time, I feel like 5th edition doesn't have enough skills. Mm-hmm. And it's given and given that when it comes to when it comes to skills, the, I end up picking on Shadowrun a bit for this because it has way, because it has way too many skills and and um, everything yeah, it does. development is, on this, is from the same pool. Yeah, <laughs> but with the set with the setup that you have, are you do are you doing a thing where each weapon type is its own separate skill? For instance, there are uh, four skills for weapons. Mm-hmm. There's your brawl for your melee, your uh, light firearm, heavy firearm, and then your ranged weapons. Just like. Crossbows, bows, things like that. Crossbows. That's it. Your your archaic ranged weapons. Yes, or throwing things mm-hmm. also falls under ranged. Yeah, but yeah, it's just those four. It's not like shotguns, rifles. No, you don't have those. You have your heavy weapons, which are your shotguns, your rifles, your Gatling guns, things like that. And then you have your light, which are your plethora of pistols. Now, with that with that in mind, let's talk a bit about combat. How squishy are characters expected to be? Are we talking high levels of grit where the ro- where one wrong roll it can send can send you into the dirt, or something a little lighter? Uh, it's pretty gritty. Um, like your average character is going to have uh, ten wounds, mm-hmm. and uh, your your average uh, gun is going to do uh, four damage. So it doesn't take too many shots before you just go down. Now, a lot of games that do have um, high damage will have, will have various ways of mitigating that damage. Um, I'd say one of the bigger examples in this kind of thing is World of Darkness, where even if you even if you do a whole lot of a big chunk of damage after it goes through soak you still have to roll those da- those damage die and that and that determines whether or not you actually wound do you have do you have steps where that where there are where there are going to be means of mitigating damage beyond just base defense uh no there's soak mm-hmm. for your armor and having a shield will also give you soak, but soak only goes so high. It's more of a you need to be wary of your position mm-hmm. because cover is essential. Right. The, I'm perfectly fine with that. The um, frag system uses something not too far off, where cover is definitely going to be key. Mm-hmm. And and of course, I always I always love when for, when when diehard 40k fans play Infinity for the first time and then get turned into Swiss cheese because they think <laughs> doing a they think doing the open charge is going to is going to be a sound strategy. Yeah. Yeah. The um the only way uh to really I guess mitigate it would be to be through the warrior uh going through the de- the toughness and defense those trees do have ways to just like negate damage or only take half. Yeah. Do you ha- do you have so- do you have um some equivalent to dodge actions for those who want to be a bit more dexterous when it comes to mitig- when it comes to getting away from damage? You can um take cover essentially and you can turn um by spending your turn you turn uh you <laughs> say turn a whole bunch, uh, you can turn partial cover into full cover by sort of hunkering down. All right. And when you have full cover, you can't be hit by most things. Mm-hmm. 
There are very few exceptions, like a couple spells, a magic bullet, <laughs> that sort of thing. Now, since we mentioned spell customization, I'd like to go in a bit into customization when it comes to equipment, because we've all seen we've all seen those sto those stories or those adventures of somebody having a tr of somebody having a heavily modified or a cut or a custom built firearm in in works. Yes, uh, there are firearm modifications. Mm -hmm. You can spend money to get your make your pistol hit harder, or like have an extra shot in the chamber, custom grip so that it's easier to hit things, longer barrels, that sort of thing. I hope nobody tries to do the long, the long, long barrel that we that we saw in the first Batman movie. <laughs> the super long Joker barrel where it takes him forever to pull it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would love that, honestly. Well, I've, uh, seen, I've seen that. I've seen that in. I've seen that in some very mm -hmm. cursed Fallout New Vegas mods where the the barrel is about the barrel is about as long is twice as long as my wingspan. <laughs> right. You know, because a longer barrel means a more accurate shot, right? <laughs> yeah, more rifle. Obviously, if you just add more rifling to the barrel, it, the bullet will go farther. <laughs> um, and I, I'm no stranger to giving powerful but unsafe weapons to my party because at one at one at one point I gave I um in a different game I gave someone the equivalent of the noisy cricket for Men in Black. <laughs> oh man. You know, very, very, str very strong, son very strong amount of sonic damage that can punct that can puncture through that can puncture through concrete. But every time you fire the thing, you get knocked on your ass twenty feet. Recoils a bitch. Uh. <laughs> and in that, within, within that regard, within that regard, some games. Ha I know we brought up luck, but. Sometimes games have an extra effort system, i.e., a, a limited resource that you can pull that you can pull in to give yourself a bit of oomph to certain roles. Um, in Shadowrun, they had Edge. In World of Darkness, there's Willpower. In Eclipse Phase, there's Moxie. You get the idea, right? Um, there's. Do you have something like that for Pistol Dust? There's not an overarching system thing that everybody gets, but there are talents mm -hmm. that people can take to give themselves or their party members bonuses to things. Mm -hmm. Like, I mentioned the Oracle is sort of like the the king of that, because they can just give somebody it, like, increase somebody's dodge or give them a bonus to hit. Yeah. For for an action mm -hmm. and that's all it takes and they can do that multiple times to different people mm -hmm. or the gambler can bank rolls and spend those rolls to give themselves bonuses mm -hmm. there's no overarching but there are talents and things to do now uh, when it comes to the villain system that you have, tell me about the budget approach that you that you utilize. Is it similar to building a a um, character, or is it different? It's pretty much exactly like building a character, except you have more experience and you have more money. Mm -hmm. And with the money, you not only buy equipment for the villain, you also buy henchmen. And depending on how difficult the henchman is, it costs more money for the villain to buy. Like, a villain can go and just buy, like, 80 goons. And it's like, yeah, you've got numbers, but the goons are going to go down in, like, one hit. Or they could burn all of their money on some clockwork monster that just, it's not going to go down easily but when it does it's that's it mm -hmm. now with that in, with that in mind 
when you mentioned it mentions on the Kickstarter page having a tier system. I know you're I know you're going a bit freeform when it comes to advancement through experience, but is this tier system a, a threshold regarding how of um ex, of experience totals or something like that? Character, it's a bit loose on what exactly a tier means. Uh, a character has a sort of experience gained section, and once you hit certain thresholds, you'll you get another another wound essentially as you toughen up and you quote unquote level up. Mm -hmm. And. The starting experience that you get with a character doesn't apply to that. So it's only once you actually start playing. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as the total page count with the project? I'm, I'm not sure what the total page count will be. Currently, there's there is no art in the book, and it's just under 300 pages. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it's with all of the art, it's probably going to be closer to 320. Maybe 330. Somewhere in that ballpark. Mm -hmm. I think is going to be the final page count. All right, I I can certainly get I can certainly get behind that and are you pl are you planning on do on running any um ba any beta tests in the f near future? Uh, not not any more beta tests. I've kind of I've done a whole bunch of them before I even started the Kickstarter with several different groups of friends to kind of get a feel for how the game works. And there's been a lot of tweaking and a lot of someone going, "Hey." Did you know that you can do this? And me going, oh my god. <laughs> no. I have to fix this. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that te that tends to happen. I'm I'm reminded of I'm reminded of the difference between a programmer whose program works and a programmer whose program doesn't work. The difference, <laughs> is, the difference is Well, he he still has no matter which side of it on he's on, he still has no idea how it works. Right. But there's some really fun combos that I've seen that I I leave in cuz I'm just like, well, it's not game breaking. It's neat though. <laughs> kind of a thing. Mhm. Mm and there there of course will be people who will tr who will try and um, bend or br bend or break the system to be to be the most ridiculous builds possible. I mean, I've, uh, I mean, you're probably familiar with the Legend of Pun Pun. And I mean, yeah, but and that's totally fine. Some people like that, and people have fun. Like that's how people have fun with these kinds of games. Is by I want to see how far I can bend this mm -hmm. to break this. I want to break this. And that's their whole goal in playing. That's totally fine. Mm -hmm. it, it's up to the DM to kind of wrangle those people in and be like, yeah, I know it says you can do that. However, <laughs> I don't think you should. Well, when the GM says, are you sure, best to listen. Right. I've <laughs> Time to reevaluate your life choices up until that point. Oh, I've had I've had a few cases where so, where somebody didn't listen when I said stealth is not optional for this mission. <laughs> yeah, and and paid for it. Or some people think that hey, I'm, hey, I, hey, if I even though the DC is like thir is like thirty five or something, I still have a five percent chance to actually to succeed if I roll an at twenty. <laughs> Yeah. I covered that in in Pistol Dust mm -hmm. too when I talk about luck because you have the crit success. Yeah, sure. You got good luck. That doesn't mean you succeed. It just means something good happened. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you auto succeeds a check. The but and rule. Yes. 
nobody nobody actually calls it that. I just call I just call it that as a catch all for that kind of thing. Yeah. And I mean that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's yeah. equally funny when somebody thinks that they'll have a chance to succeed and th and then they botch it. <laughs> yes. It's like, well, if I manage to chew this and get a luck check and I succeed that, then I can do this. Well, n no. Good luck, though. <laughs> well, that well, that was the first mistake was thinking that the dice gods were on their side. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> As I've mentioned many, many times here in the temple, the dice um the dice gods are a model of equality. It does not it does not matter your your race, gender, gender identity, whatever. The dice gods hate you. No. Nope. And even though Pistol Dust has uh quite a few things that build on luck and there's in fact a luck god mm -hmm. known as the lady um she is merciless as she is kind <laughs> sounds about right also also i have i have to give a bit of a chuckle to it being the lady yep <laughs> she is the lady mm -hmm. but with all that no one mm -hmm. dares speak her name <laughs> What is is this like the Lady of Pain from Planescape? There's a deep oh, cut. How's geez. that for a deep cut? <laughs> oh jeez. No. Go ahead. <laughs> Thankfully not. <laughs> yeah. If it was the Lady of Pain, we'd have a few problems. Well, yeah, this would be a very different game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Of course. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and, Good of, times. and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!